Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Thank you for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to welcome Ramez Nam to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Ramez is here today to discuss his book, The Infinite Resource, The Power of, the Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. We're beset by an array of natural resource and environmental threats. They pose a risk to human prosperity, to world peace, and to the planet itself. To improve our chances of survival, we need to supercharge our process of innovation and make smart choices for our planet and our economy. Ramez Nam spent 13 years at Microsoft, working on Exchange, Outlook, IE, and Bing. He was born in Cairo and lives in Seattle, where he writes full-time. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thanks, Amy, and, and thanks, all. It's great to be here and see a lot of friendly faces and, and people who I know and some who I don't know as well. Uh, so I left Microsoft in late 2009. It's been about three and a half years, and I've been busy since then. Uh, I've got three books that I've finished in that time. Uh, the first one that came out is Nexus, my sci-fi novel. It's available in the back about linking brains. The next one that's about to come out is the sequel to this, and I'm going to show you the cover, which no one has seen yet, and we haven't revealed, so please do not tweet this or share this or anything yet. For a few more days, and the video will take a little while to get online. This is the cover to, to Crux, which is the sequel to Nexus. Um, but of course, we're here to talk about a different book, which is this one that, that Amy just introduced. Um, there's a history behind this book. I started working on this book before I left Microsoft. I just didn't know it. In 2008, I was on vacation in this spot. This is Tulum uh, in the Yucatan, Mexico. And I spent almost a whole day swimming off the beach here. Just an incredibly gorgeous place. There's actually just a little bit of litter on the beach. And for whatever reason, I started thinking about, it's so beautiful here, but there's a little bit of pollution. I really want to make it a priority to figure out what the situation of the planet is and what my responsibilities are. And I'm, I'm by heart, a techno-optimist. Uh, so that's the attitude that I came to this from. It turns out it was fitting that it was, this was the place where I started working on the book without knowing yet that it was going to be a book because of one other thing, which is that that castle there is this ancient Mayan city of Tulum. And it was one of the last outposts of a civilization that collapsed after reaching the height of its power uh, over a thousand years of growth, suddenly in a few decades, just collapsed to nothing. And it was really a story of uh, ecological overstretch, of overusing resources, while at the same time being beset by some uh, natural issues, actually climate change that happened to them, uh, that then just toppled them over the edge. So that kind of ended up being an interesting uh, twofold motivation there. I start the book with a line from Dickens, which is, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, one of the most famous couplets in the English language, because that sort of captures the zeitgeist right now. I talk a lot in, in Silicon Valley, and here I am at Microsoft, and so a lot of us with a technology background really have this notion of the future is going to be a, a techno-utopia, but there's also a lot of people who are deep thinkers who have a very different view of what the future might hold. Okay, what's this? That's an easy one. There will be more questions, and they will get harder. Okay? Um, so let's start with best of times before I depress you. Okay? Um, I was born in a neighborhood a lot like this in Cairo, a working class neighborhood. Uh, and that story of what's changed there and here, for me, captures how much progress has been made. When I was born, Infant mortality there was about 15%. About 15% of kids didn't reach their fifth birthday. I was a preemie by about one month. So my odds of reaching my fifth birthday were actually about three and four. When my parents were born, it was actually much worse than that. About one in four kids didn't reach their fifth birthday. And in fact, in my dad's family, Three kids died in infancy. In my mom's, five kids died in infancy. My dad wasn't even the first kid to have his name. They recycled it from the kid before who was born and died in infancy, which is just how it was in those days. So uh, growing up in the US, I came here at the age of three, I had this amazing perspective of, wow, it's so much better here than it is in the developing world where we came from. Um, 
But it turns out I wasn't just getting a look at another culture, I was getting a look back in time. Because in the US, in 1900, infant mortality was 25%. In Chicago that year, one in three kids didn't make their fifth birthday. So that's, that's where we've come from across the entire planet, and things have just changed tremendously. Now in Egypt it's down at 2% infant mortality, and in the US it's about 0.7%, and in Europe it's about 0.5%. So that progress is just astounding. You can see it in other metrics. I love metrics, I love numbers. Um, average years of life, life expectancy around the planet has just soared over the last half century. In fact, we went back to 1900, the worldwide life expectancy was about 30 years. And now it's more than double that. And if you look closely, you'll see that the gap between the red and black lines is closing. So we're actually making the most gains right now in the developing world, uh, catching up to the rich world in almost every way. Uh, extreme poverty. Someone mentioned to me, The Economist has an article on this uh, this week. Extreme poverty around the world has plummeted. Using uh, $1 a day as the metric, we've gone from more than a third of humanity living at that level to about 5%. If you use higher thresholds of $2 a day, so on and so forth, you still see this sharp decline, though the final numbers uh, might be different. But via any metric you use, poverty, hunger, so on, you see that it's just plummeting, and now people are seriously talking about, in the next 20 years, maybe we could end extreme poverty around the world, period. That's what we're, where we're at. Education, the most fundamental enabler of people that allows them to make a better life for themselves, it's gone up tremendously. This is on a log scale. Obviously in the US we've gotten more and more educated, but let's pick two countries, Ethiopia and India, to represent the developing world and watch what happens with their average years of schooling per person alive over the last century and less. And you see a tremendous rate of growth there and again a convergence between cultures. That combined with technology, the work that many of us have been involved with, uh, the internet, computers, mobile phones, has tremendously uh, leveled social playing fields. And now we see a larger fraction of nations around the world are democracies than has ever been the case on the planet before. And a larger fraction of people live in a democracy than ever on the planet before. So plenty, plenty, plenty of positive trends for humanity. There are also some bad things. There are also some problems that we're facing. And that's really what I wanted to write the book about is how do we overcome those problems. The planet's lungs, also the Economist magazine, calls them, or the planet's forests, sorry, the Economist calls them the lungs of the Earth. They're vital in recycling water, in forcing rainfall to happen, in cleaning the air, in holding down soils. In antiquity, in hunter-gatherer times, almost two-thirds of the planet's land area was covered in forest. Now it's about one-third. We've actually made good strides in halting or slowing at least the rate of deforestation, but there's still a tremendous change to be exerted on the face of the planet, mostly due to agriculture. That's really what's driven this. Fresh water. Water is life. Without that, uh, you can't really do anything. In fact, we use 70% of all fresh water around the world to grow food. It's not the showers you take or your dishwasher. It's really growing food primarily that is the, the, the drain of this. And there are problems. Let me know what, what this is. It's one, of the, it's one of the lakes in, in uh, Asia that's, you're, you're going to show the next pictures that, that show it getting dehydrated and then refilled. <laughs> that's right. This is the RLC. The RLC is the fourth largest body of fresh water in the world. Actually, it was the fourth largest body of fresh water in the world. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Uh, the RLC got pumped out by first the USSR and then Russia and the Ukraine to grow wheat and cotton in the Ukraine and Baltic states. Uh, and it's basically just gone. It's dotted by the remnants of fishing villages, just boats up on the sand, essentially. Now, the RLC is between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Many of us couldn't find that on a map, not easily. Uh, so does it really apply to us? Maybe a little bit. Who can name this body of water? Olagala Aquifer. Yes, the Olagala Aquifer. Because you don't, we don't have a giant uh, inland lake or sea here. We have an underground giant body of fresh water here. And this is what you call fossil water. We, we use the idea of fossil fuels. Fossil water is water that was left behind at the end of the last ice age. As the glaciers melted, they filled up this giant under, underground reservoir. 
Now, that recharge rate from rainfall for this reservoir is about 10,000 years. But since 1950, we've drained about a third of it. So we've drained about 3,000 years of refill out in about 60 years. And we're on pace for more than half of it to be gone in the next 20 years. In the middle of this aquifer, we see that the water level is dropping about three feet per year. And that's because it's out of sight, out of mind. If this was a surface lake in the US, we would all notice this and we wouldn't allow it to happen. But the way that it is sort of uh, hidden away from us, it does happen. And once this water is gone, on the time scale of human civilization, it's not coming back. We're not going to wait 10,000 years for it to come back. Right? There's plenty of fish in the sea. We all know that saying. Well, there used to be more fish in the sea. When you look at the set of fish species that humans consume, Every one of them is either at its maximum rate that it can be harvested right now, or more likely um, in some stage of collapse, meaning that we're extracting fish from the ocean more rapidly than uh, reproduction can replace them. Right? Fish are a renewable resource at a certain level. If you fish them slowly enough, the fish stocks replenish. But we're not doing that. We're fishing them overly hard because no one puts real limits on this on a, a global basis. And then there's the most pervasive risk that makes all others worse, which is climate change. The planet has a fever, essentially. Uh, this is a graph of temperature change over the last 130 years. You'll see it's, it's a jagged line. It bounces all around. It's up, it's down, 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 up, up, up. It's very, very noisy. And yet, over the long term, it is inexorably rising. And in fact, if you look at sort of the trend lines over progressively shorter periods of time, you see the slope just keeps getting worse, actually, and the planet keeps warming. And that's almost two degrees Fahrenheit, effectively, that's happened uh, since the start of industrialization. Now, some of you may have heard this notion that climate change has stopped and the planet has stopped warming. So let me just show you this graph. This is what we call the climate escalator, which is at any point, if you want to, you can draw a convenient line that shows, oh, for the last X years, actually, the temperature has gone down or it hasn't moved. Uh, yet somehow, if you draw a longer line, it always ends up that it's going down. So climate is a very, very noisy thing, yet from that noise, we can extract a clear signal, which is that red line that is going up and up and up. We know, of course, that it's CO2 that does this. CO2 levels just a few weeks ago, for the first time, reached 400 parts per million, this line right here, uh, in the atmosphere, which hasn't happened in millions of years. And for the last million, actually, the highest they've been has been, uh, most people say, about 280. Um, we're on pace, if we keep going at this rate, that by the end of the century, it'll be 1,000 parts per million in the atmosphere, or three times higher than it's been for millions of years. And you can see this clear correlation between what happens with, with temperature as CO2 concentrations rise. Now, as I said, it's been millions of years. Actually, if you look, the last time CO2 levels were this high, about four or five million years ago, there was no Arctic. And in fact, there was almost no ice in Greenland. So we had various problems. Now, I love graphs. Graphs persuade me, but they don't persuade everyone. So let's use a little pictorial evidence as well. This is the uh, Peterson Glacier in Alaska. That's what it looked like in 1920. That's what it looks like now. This is the Bear Glacier in Alaska, 1920. And here's what that same area looks like now. It's a dramatic transformation. The planet warms fastest near the poles uh, at night and inland. So the areas around the Arctic are warming the fastest by far. Now this, of course, people start thinking, oh, ice is melting, sea level rise. That's what you hear is the most commonly worried about concern of climate change, right? Sea level rise. And the seas will rise. They're supposed to rise between one and two meters, or about three to six feet, over the course of the century. But that's pretty slow, actually. And that, when we think about it that way, we think, oh, it's a future threat. We'll have to worry about it sometime before 2100. But the reality is that there's actually threats that are happening right now and have been happening for some time. And it's not involved with sea level. It's the weather and the impact that has on our ability to grow food, actually, which is the most basic uh, energy source we have. In 2003, Europe was hit with the worst heat wave on record since 1540. Actually, it was worse than 1540, but 1540 is about as far back as records go. So it's the worst heat wave ever recorded in over 500 years, or almost 500 years, of records. 70% of Ukraine's wheat crop failed. 10% of Portugal's forests burned down in that summer. 
About 70,000 people died across Europe as a result of this heat wave. Now, we can't ever say, because of one weather event, oh, climate change caused that. It doesn't work that way. Weather happens. You have extreme droughts even if you don't have climate change. But we can say, with climate change, certain events are much more likely to happen. And we know that this event was between five and 10 times more likely to happen because of the amount of warming that's happened so far. Or we should expect five to 10 times as many events like this in the years to come. In 2009, China was hit with a once in a century level drought. <clears throat> in 2010, it was hit with another once in a century level drought, which is, I don't know probability very well, but something's wrong with that right there. Uh, wells that are given water continuously for 500 years stopped doing so. Now, these droughts happen because warmer air has higher moisture demand. It's able to absorb more moisture, about 7%, 8% more per degree Celsius. Now, that doesn't mean that it happens homogeneously. If it did, the whole world would just be more humid. Instead, what happens is it sucks it away rapidly from one place and then deposits it rapidly in another place. And so when the rains came back in Pakistan in 2010, an area twice the size of California was underwater. Floods that have never been recorded of this magnitude in Pakistan before. 15 million people were displaced from their homes. It's tremendous. In Russia in 2010, also had the worst heat wave they'd ever seen. 55,000 people died in Russia in July and August of 2010. 11,000 people died in Moscow alone in two months due to the heat. That's worse than any terrorist attack that you know of. But we don't treat it exactly that way. And of course, the US has had its share of problems as well. We're now three years into the worst drought we've seen since the Dust Bowl. Uh, last year, we lost about a quarter of the US corn crop. If you noticed, last summer, uh, beef was really cheap. It was really cheap because hay, the hay crop was devastated, and so farmers were slaughtering their herds uh, because there was nothing else they could do. They couldn't afford to feed them. So we're seeing some issues with this in the US as well. And the climate models say we're in for much, much worse, many times worse, if things continue as they have been going forward. Now, that's what we call linear change. But of course, we know about complex systems have these feedback loops. Sometimes you do one thing, and it makes something worse, which feeds back to making the original thing worse. One of those feedback loops is the vanishing ice. You may have heard last summer that the ice cap reached its, the lowest point it's been at in thousands of years. And there's a negative feedback loop there, which is that when the ice melts, ice reflects back about 90% of the energy that hits it. The water below it is almost black and reflects back only 10% with energy that hits it. That remaining delta is additional heat that enters that water, which leads to faster melting of the sea ice, and there you go. And in fact, if we reconstruct what's happened with Arctic sea ice over the last 1,400 years, this is what we see. Like anything else in climate, it's wobbly, it moves around, it's very noisy, but then suddenly, around the time of industrialization, it goes off a cliff, right? If this were your business plan and we flipped the graph, it would look great. Here's your hockey stick. Well, it's not exactly, it's more like a, a hockey cliff uh, going on here. And in fact, people criticize climate modelers because climate models are very, very complex. They get a lot of things wrong. There's a lot of variability in them. So people say, oh, climate models are just, they're predicting things that aren't going to happen. The reality is going to be not nearly as bad. But the climate models didn't expect this to happen until about the middle of the 22nd century. So we're actually about 130 years early on the melt of the Arctic ice cap. Doesn't mean that they won't be wrong in the opposite direction sometimes, but there's a lot of variability and a lot of risk in the way that we look at these systems. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that if the Arctic ice cap were entirely gone in June, which is about maybe 20, 30 years away at current pace, that just the added capture of sunlight hitting the dark water would have a heating impact about as large as all human CO2 emissions. So we could get to a point where even if we stopped emitting CO2, just the added heating from the darkening we've done to the planet would keep warming the planet at the rate that it's been warming, which is not a situation we want to see, obviously. And in fact, another problem is that in the Arctic, this was tundra, now it's what we call a thaw lake, which is when land's been frozen for thousands of years, starts to melt from the top as sunlight hits it. This area is loaded with carbon, carbon from decaying plants 
and it bubbles up in the form of methane, which is actually about 25 times worse in its heating impact. And there's enough carbon buried here, about a trillion tons, to dwarf everything that humans have done in warming so far. So we're sort of sitting on a time bomb. We don't want this to escape into the atmosphere. Now, if we put all of this together, people try to calculate what is the human impact on the planet and how much of the planet's resources are we using? And what they find is we're not using one planet Earth's worth of resources, we're using about one and a half planet Earth's worth of resources. I don't have a spare half a planet. Uh, if you do, let's talk. I'm sure we have a good business idea there. Further, they say that if all of humanity lived like Americans, we'd be using about five planet Earth's worth of resources. I definitely don't have four spare planet Earth's. So again, let's talk if you think that you do. The problem, a lot of people say, is rapid economic growth. Okay, what do you mean by that? Who can name what this is? This is Shanghai. Shanghai, this is Pudong, specifically. Shanghai, 20, 30 years ago, was a small town on the river where the biggest industry was fishing. And now it's this. This represents a tremendous uh, positive that has happened in the world. This went hand in hand with the drop in poverty, the drop in hunger, the rise in wealth and longevity of people in China and throughout the rest of the world. But it also means more steel, more electricity, more coal, more water, more food, all of it, right? So the, in large part, in parts of the environmental movement, you hear a cry that we have to stop this from happening, that economic growth is the problem. The problem with that idea is twofold. One, how are you going to stop people throughout the world from aspiring to and acquiring new resources to make their lives better. Two, even if you could, would it be just? Only about a billion people around the world have access to air conditioners. Okay? Less than that have access to automobiles. So how can you say to somebody, to a, a software engineer in India or an architect in, in China, oh, sorry, uh, we got rich doing this, but you can't do that as well. So I think there's a, there's a deep flaw in this sort of thinking. It's just not going to be practical. But this is the sort of thinking that you see. The Limits to Growth is the best-selling environmental book of all time, about two million copies sold, and it says essentially, uh, using computer models, it says you cannot have economic growth without over-consuming and over-polluting and eventually reaching a crash. But we have heard similar things in the past. Back in 1968, this was the number one New York Times bestseller, The Population Bomb, Paul Ehrlich. It started with a sentence, the race to feed humanity is over. At this late date, nothing can prevent a rise in the worldwide death rate. Billions will die, which was wrong. It turns out the hunger rate dropped after this book came out. It, was, it kept dropping, it had been dropping already. And the rate of food production outstripped the rate of food consumption for some time to come and still has. The same thing has been true for 200 years since Malthus wrote his book, on uh, population growth always outstripping resource production, was Malthus's thesis. But in fact, since then what's happened is that we've grown food supply faster than we've grown population. And so we've had lower and lower and lower rates of famine. So how can this happen? Let me tell you one story overcoming adversity. There's a bunch of fun stories you can tell here. This, is, this one is one of the, the more interesting, I think. Who knows what this is? Sperm whale, very good, okay. People usually know that's a whale. Um, Pacific sperm whale. The sperm whales almost went extinct in the 1850s. Okay? They almost went extinct because a fleet of about 1,000 whaling boats from North America hunted them. And over the course of about 20 years, we killed off a third of the species. About a quarter million sperm whales we killed off. Now, North Americans don't eat whale meat, really. Maybe a few Inuits do, but that's not why we hunted them. We hunted them because sperm whale oil was the premier source of lighting at that time. These are sperm whale lamps. Uh, sperm whale oil burns with a clear flame that doesn't flicker and doesn't produce smoke. So it was a, in high demand. Now what happened was we went through a cycle that was sort of like a, a peak oil cycle, but for peak sperm whale oil. The high demand for this led to more and more boats being built, going out trying to harvest these whales, but then the whales got more scarce because we had killed more and more of them, and the ones that remained became more and more uh, frightened of and wary of humanity. In fact, Moby Dick was written about a real event where a uh, 
whaling boat saw a pod of female sperm whales attack them. A nearby male, who was apparently the victim of, of several human attacks, saw this happen, dove, came up and rammed this boat called the Essex, dove, came back and rammed this boat again, and sank it with all hands on board. So that's, that was the inspiration from Moby Dick was these events. Now the way that we address this, we have lighting today, right? We did not address this by finding more sperm whales. That was not, that was not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem was innovation to tap into a different resource. It was this man, Abraham Gessner, who was a Canadian geologist and physician, because back in those days you could be a geologist and a physician at the same time. He saw that there was a huge demand for quality lighting. So he went out trying to find a way to address this demand, and he created kerosene. And kerosene, it turned out, was far cheaper, was actually far more abundant. The resource pool was much bigger than we had imagined. It wasn't limited to sperm whales. Um, and he could produce it without killing any whales. So far as we know, Gessner was not an environmentalist. He never mentions the whales in his diaries at all. Uh, but potentially, he saved the species or saved them from even more dramatic winnowing uh, by pursuing this opportunity. Hi. So physical resources in many cases are much vaster than we imagine. Often we're tapped into a small resource pie that we think is the whole resource, but there's actually a much larger resource pie around. And what we have to do is not uh, imagine there's a larger set, not even shrink our consumption necessarily, but tap into the larger set in a way that we can do so sustainably. So let's start with what those are. Let's talk about energy. This drop of oil represents all human energy consumption per year. It's a very, very, very large drop of oil, be larger than Seattle. Um, it, however, is dwarfed by the input of energy from an even vaster source, which is a large fusion reactor about 8.3 light minutes from here called the sun. The input of the sun's energy to the earth, the amount of sunlight hitting the earth each year is about 10,000 times the amount of energy that we use from all sources combined. So what keeps the planet warm, um, if we think of this in another way, 10 seconds of sunlight hitting the Earth is equivalent in its energy content to one day of humanity's energy use. Or one hour of sunlight hitting the planet is equivalent in its energy content to one year of humanity's energy use. So the physical resource of energy is large. It manifests by heating the atmosphere differentially, causing winds to blow that we can tap into. It drives evaporation of moisture that then condenses and comes back down somewhere else, creating hydropower that we can tap into. And the direct photons just reach the surface of the Earth, where they are so abundant, actually, that about one-third of 1% 1 of humanity of the land area of the planet, these little green boxes, would provide enough land using today's technology to capture enough energy to uh, maintain human society actually up to 2030 at the rate of growth. So there is plenty of energy available to us. There's also plenty of water. We're running out of fresh water, but we live on a water world. It's 70% covered by water, right? It's just that water is not potable water. That water is salt water. Humanity accesses about 0.3% of the fresh water in the world. That fresh water is less than 3% of all the water in the world. The vast reservoir of water is in the world's oceans. So if we could tap into those in a way that was cost effective, environmentally sound, and energy effective, there is more than enough water for all of our needs. The same is true of food. Farms convert less than one one hundredth of one percent of the energy hitting them in sunlight into food that humans eat. Now, there are other limits of minerals in the soil and so on, but this study from the International Food Policy Research Institute estimated that while humanity grows about 2.6 billion tons of grain today, that the planet could grow overall more than 70 billion tons of food with sufficiently mature farming technology. So in all of these cases, the problem isn't the size of the resource, it's our ability to access the resource or access the larger resource pool that's all around us. And the right ideas can multiply that resource access. So let's start again with energy. This is a wafer of solar cells. If it looks a lot like a wafer of chips, it's because they're built frequently in a way that's very similar. Silicon wafers have to be extremely pure, uh, fashioned at high heat, and that makes them very, very expensive. But that cost has been dropping rapidly. I'm sure many of you have heard about this. Over the last 20 years, 
or 30 years in this case, the cost of solar power has dropped from more than $20 a watt down to less than $1 a watt. I think today you can buy solar panels for about 77 cents a watt, actually. Another study I saw recently said it was $77 per watt in the mid-1970s. So you can now buy about 100 times as much solar power per dollar as you could in the mid-1970s. This is an exponential curve, actually. This is a log scale. It looks sort of like Moore's Law. It's not nearly as fast as Moore's Law. This is maybe 8% a year, as opposed to the 40% a year that we get in Moore's Law. But it's still a tremendous, tremendous uh, decline in price. And that means that we're seeing the crossover where solar gets cheaper than fossil energy happening in different areas starting today and extending out over the next decade or so. If you look at the a map of the U.S. by amount of sunlight we get, uh, these areas that are the darkest red in the southwest, already today, solar is as cheap as grid electricity. Now, unfortunately, uh, we're up here, which is the, the least light, <laughs> the least uh, insulated area, but what will happen is that the viability of solar will spread out through these ripples of color and it become more and more viable over time. In fact, on current trend, in 10 years, in this area, solar will cost half of what grid electricity costs overall, if we can maintain that trend, and that's the key here. We also need to store energy as well, right? We don't just use energy uh, during the daytime when the sun is shining or even just when the wind is blowing. We have to be able to use it when neither of those sources is available. We have to be able to use it in high density in vehicles as well. So we want the price of storage to go down and the density to go up. And this is what happened to just one storage technology, lithium-ion batteries, over a period of about 15 years as uh, producers of laptops and tablets and cell phones competed to make their products lighter, longer lasting in their battery, and cheaper. We saw price of storage drop by a factor of 10, and we saw the density, the amount of storage per gram of battery, nearly triple in that time. So we, we're about one more cycle of this away from storage being uh, no longer an obstacle in the deployment of renewable energy, if we can maintain the same path, the same pace of innovation, which is always the question. If we can crack energy, we can crack pretty much anything else. Uh, that problem, with that access to water issue, the real issue with desalination is how much energy does it take to desalinate water? And in fact, with more energy we could do it, we've also gotten more efficient at desalination. Desalination technology in 1970 was basically the same technology we've had since the Greeks. It was boil the water, capture the steam, let it condense, which is not the most efficient way you can go about doing this. But since then, we started to do bio biomimicry. We're mimicking the membranes that uh, keep biological cells able to let certain things in and keep other things out. So since 1970, we've cut the amount of energy it takes to desalinate water by about a factor of 10. This is kilowatt hours per cubic meter of energy, if you care. Uh, now in the most high-tech desalination plants in the world, in places like Israel, you can buy desalinated water for about five gallons per penny is the price that those places charge, which is still a lot more expensive than agricultural water is, but that price decline continues. Agriculture also, we know that we can meet the needs of the planet. We have to grow about 70% more food to meet expected agricultural demand by 2050. But if we look at how much we grow in different areas, the U.S. already grows about double the world's average. And the reason for that is mostly energy. It's that we have tractors, we have good irrigation systems, we have the ability to deploy uh, fertilizer in large areas, and that's what is missing from the developing world primarily. Now, I've just been talking about how ideas can multiply our access to resources, but they can also shrink the resources that we need to use. Let's stick with agriculture again. Before agriculture started, when we were hunter-gatherers, it took about 3,000 acres to feed one person on Earth. So this was the footprint of one hunter-gatherer. On average, they varied between tribes and spaces and so on. In the last 10,000 years, we've shrunk the amount of land needed to feed one person by this much, by about a factor of 10,000. Now it takes about one third of one acre of modern farmland to feed one person. And even that is down by a factor of three since 1950. 
That's because of something called the Green Revolution, which was mostly about designing better seeds. Now, some people have the impression that that has meant a huge increase in the amount of energy that we've used in farming. And we do use tractors and oil and natural gas to make fertilizer and so on. But if we look at American farms, look at the amount of energy used per calorie grown, it's actually dropped by about a factor of two since the start of the Green Revolution as well. We are using energy to do this. We are using fossil fuels, but we're actually more efficient in farming than at any point in history as well. This is data from the USDA. Everywhere you look, you see that we've gotten more efficient. We, people don't appreciate this, but flying is tremendously cheaper than it was when it first came into the popular uh, society. Right? People used to dress up with suits and ties get on an airplane because it was such a, such a remarkable thing. Now, the modern fleet of aircraft takes about one-third as much fuel per passenger mile to fly than did the jet airliners of the 1960s. Even our total consumption per person, Americans burn less oil than ever before in the U.S., down from about 30 barrels a person per day, or sorry, per year, down to about 16 now, and forecast to continue dropping. And it'll probably drop faster than that, that forecast there. Water use as well. And this is remarkable, actually. For decades, the average American's use of water climbed and climbed and climbed. But in the 1970s, mostly because our farming got more efficient, it stalled. And now we actually use less water than we have, actually in the newest figures we've got here, than we have since around World War II. Almost entirely because we've gotten more efficient in our agriculture. Now, I don't want to tell you that this is fast enough. We'd like this number to go down to, to here. We'd like that oil number to go down much faster than it is. But it demonstrates that you can keep growing wealth, keep growing your economy while shrinking resource use if you innovate in the right ways. Innovation also, as a wonderful byproduct, as it creates wealth, it reduces the rate of population growth. In 1950, the average woman on Earth had five children over the course of her lifetime. And now we're down to 2.4. And when that crosses the 2 line, actually about 2.1, population growth ends. And everywhere we look, if women are empowered, if they have education, if a society is growing in wealth, we see population growth ending. Uh, in countries you wouldn't expect, Brazil is down to 1.6 children per woman. Iran is down to 1.4 children per woman. So a lot of cultures that you would imagine are having a huge family still aren't. They've already made that transition. And anywhere you look where there is high population growth, you find high poverty. So rather than thinking, oh, we have to stop the growth economically to save the planet, when we actually help people get into wealth, we actually stop the growth of population. And maybe my geekiest two graphs, <clears throat> I wanted to illustrate this very quantitatively. I'm talking about a decoupling. I'm talking about the ability to, to grow wealth while not growing resource use, and ideally to shrink it. This is what's happened in the US. The green line is GDP per capita. The red lines are CO2 emissions per person and energy use per person. And since 1970, you see that these two red lines, the pollution and consumption lines, are flat, while wealth has roughly doubled in that time. In fact, the average living space per person in the US has nearly tripled in that time. So this is a decoupling. Some of that is because the US has outsourced manufacturing to other parts of the world. But even looking at it on a global basis, it looks very, very similar. Not quite as pronounced, but again, you see flat CO2 emissions per person, slight increased energy use, and a market increase in wealth. Okay, so how is this? How is it that possible that you can keep getting richer without using more resources? So let's think about this. This is a smartphone. I know I should have used a Windows phone. I'm sorry. Um, and on the right is ENIAC, the world's first digital computer from my alma mater, University of Illinois. ENIAC filled a room many times larger than this. It had its own dedicated uh, power station to power it. And it was less powerful than anything that you have on you. I mean, maybe your, your wedding ring might have more CPU than this thing did. If you try to make something like a modern smartphone using ENIAC, this is an, an old iPhone, if you tried to make this iPhone using ENIAC, you'd have a cube that was two miles on a side and consumed more power than the entire state of California. And it couldn't play games or take pictures or talk to your friends or you know, angry birds or whatever. So how, how is that possible? How can you have so much more using so much less? It's because this thing isn't made of plastic and metal. Okay, we think it is. It's not. It's made of condensed information. 
We, have, we know bits versus atoms, right? This physical object is made mostly of bits. I'm not talking about the software on it. I'm talking about its physical design is mostly the accumulation of decades or even centuries of knowledge about electromagnetics, computing, mathematics, materials, and so on. That's how you can have less resource use and yet more output at the end. And unlike physical resources, ideas have some unique properties. They're not depleted by usage. They don't break suddenly. Uh, if you share one with someone else, you're not impoverished of it. Instead, they actually accumulate and multiply. And the more of them you have, the more you can put them together in new forms. So that's the, the most fundamentally optimistic thing I think I see about the world as a whole. OK, so I guess the problem solved, we can all go home, right? It's not solved. What we have is really a race. It's a race between how fast we're doing damage and how fast we can innovate. And it's not actually clear that we're winning this race. As much as I've talked about all the awesome trends in innovation, it's not clear that they are rapid enough right now. There are many, many challenges. Let me just give you two. One is scale. I talked about how the small the set of areas are that we need to capture solar energy to power the planet. They're very small as a fraction of our land. They're only you know, less than 1 60th the amount of desert land we have. Plenty of land, plenty of energy. But on the scale of the industrial production needed to produce all those solar panels, it is vast. This is the Nellis Air Force Base uh, solar array. It's a 10 megawatt array. This is actually about a tenth of it. It's about a 1 megawatt array right here. We need to make about 80 million of these, if we wanted to use just solar, to uh, meet the world's demand for energy. So what you're talking about is plenty of energy available, plenty of land available, but a industrial mobilization that's sort of on the scale of World War II overall. It doesn't necessarily have to happen in those few years. It can happen over a few decades. But if you do the math right now, you're looking at somewhere in the ballpark of $50 trillion, plus or minus a lot taking the 2050 and a lot of climate change happening in that time. So as powerful as our innovation is, it still is putting us not in a zone we want to be in, in terms of pace of being able to solve this. So that's one problem. But the big problem, I think, is market failure. And this, is what, this is the reason that we're not moving fast enough right now. I'm, who knows what this is? It's a bridge, very good, Z. This is the Cuyahoga River outside of Cleveland. It's a lovely place, kind of bucolic. Um, it wasn't always this way. In 1968, you could stick your hand in this river and have it come out covered in oil and chemicals and garbage and so on. And so why was that? What was wrong here? This was a market failure. Okay? What happened was that the river was lined with factories and warehouses. And those factories and warehouses reasoned very logically from their own perspective, hey, I've got this garbage. The easiest thing for me to do is just to dump it in the river. That's probably why they're situated by the river in the first place. And in fact, not only did they make this choice, the system they were in, the market, selected for that choice. If one warehouse or one factory here decided, oh, I'm actually going to ship my garbage somewhere else inland where it can be safely disposed of, that would have added to their costs. As their costs went up, they would have been driven out of business by their lower cost competitors, who would have then taken over their facilities and kept on their same practice of dumping stuff into the river. The market algorithm, this is what it is, said to these guys, this is the way to optimize your profit because there's no cost. This is not costing you anything. It's not costing anybody anything. But it was costing someone something. It was doing economic damage. Of the 30 fish species originally in this river, there were two left at this time, which nobody seemed to care about. But then something else happened, which is that in 1969, a railroad car crossing a bridge over this river, its wheels struck a spark off the railroad. The spark flew down into a pile of refuse and oil floating on the river, and the river caught on fire. This was the 13th time the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. Um, but this, the, last, the time before had been during World War II, the nation was distracted. This time, it made the cover of Time magazine. Uh, it was joked about on The Tonight Show. Uh, some colored television was out there. And this led to change. 1969, this happened. In 1970, the EPA was created. By 73, we had the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Because people woke up and said, hey, that's not, that's not cool with me, actually. I'm not, actually not OK with the river is catching on fire. And there's obviously something wrong here. Um, every, almost, almost every environmental problem that exists is 
a market failure, is a tragedy of the commons. If you look at the things that are depleted, they are mostly things that have no owners and thus no prices on them and thus no restrictions on how much they can be depleted and so on. Whether it's deforestation, freshwater depletion, fish in the ocean who no one owns, air pollution, and even climate change. All of those happen because no one feels a motive for themselves to protect that property or has ownership over it overall. The tragedy of the commons, right? A way that I think about this, being a software guy, is garbage in, garbage out. We all know this idea, right? You can have the best algorithm in the world, and you can feed it garbage data, and it will produce garbage output. So the market is an amazingly positive, amazingly powerful algorithm. It is the reason people are rising out of poverty in China and India and so on. But it has this flaw that if you give it a resource that has no price, if you need an input of zero for the value of this river, this forest, this lake, or this climate, it will produce a garbage output. And that garbage output is what kind of industrial activity happens, how does this resource get treated? And that's what we're doing right now. Now this, this is a starkly different view than the limits to growth view. The limits to growth view is, it's not about the algorithms or anything, it's just about if you grow more, if you do more resource, uh, more wealth creation, you will deplete more. I'm saying something different. I'm saying you can keep raising your wealth if you fix the algorithm so that the natural resources are protected. And in fact, the Cuyahoga River is an example of that because this is the Cuyahoga now. You can drink out of it. We're now back to about 27 of those 30 fish species are in there. But the average wealth per person of people in Cleveland has tripled since 1970. So putting those regulations to protect this river did not stop economic growth. It didn't. We kept getting richer while protecting that resource at the same time. So we decoupled growth from pollution. The problem is not resources that we face. It's the rules that make up our economy and our system. Okay. And in fact, we've done it more than once. Remember the ozone hole? In the 1970s, we woke up to the awareness that the ozone layer was being depleted. We argued about it for decades, actually, at least for several years, with industry claiming there was no problem for the most part, and scientists claiming there was, until we acted on it. We signed something called the Montreal Protocol, and that Montreal Protocol uh, said that we had to phase out CFCs, the chemicals and refrigerants that were destroying the ozone layer. And What's happened is that the ozone layer has now kind of hit bottom. It will take decades for it to recover and is actually improving ahead of schedule because what happened to CFC output was this. It went off a cliff down. But contrary to the scare, scares that were given to us at that time, refrigeration did not fail. Medicines did not start going bad in hospitals at this point. Uh, you were still able to get milk at home. Uh, your car air conditioner still worked because we innovated. At the time that we signed the Montreal Protocol, we actually did not have a replacement for CFCs. There was not one known. But two years later, we did, and it became economical. Okay? When that impetus is there, when that motivation is there, people figure it out. Same thing with acid rain. Remember acid rain? This is a big problem. We solved acid rain, mostly. We did it by creating a new economic system called cap and trade. We did it in the George Bush administration where we said, OK, we're going to take a market-driven approach. Before this, environmental rules were usually micromanagement. They were, you will install this equipment in this facility. Hundreds of, of people would come in and tell you what to do. This was different. We'd say, OK, we're going to shrink the number of allowances for sulfur dioxide pollution each year. Sulfur dioxide is what causes acid rain. We're just going to drop them, drop them, drop them, drop them. You get them an allocation how much you've been producing in the past. But now, you can trade them. If you can shrink your, your usage faster, then that shrinkage of your allowance, you can sell the excess. If you can't, you can buy the excess, but it keeps going down. And in fact, we've done this at about a quarter of the price that was projected. We've cut sulfur dioxide emissions by more than half. In general, we, this is the issue. We have this situation of externalities. We have the market is this big and what it can manage. It can manage things that have prices, uh, owners, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a larger set of things that we actually care about. Right? So the, the ultimate fix for most of these things, it helps drive the technology fixes, is to change that balance, to plug in the correct values of the things we care about and grow the market so that it can uh, correctly manage these things. Improving the market algorithm, if you will. Now today, obviously, the biggest of these problems I'm talking about is climate change. And so we need to tackle that in a similar way. But this is a very, very large problem. And everything we do in our society produces some greenhouse gas. So people worry rightly that, oh, we could tank the economy. We could put people in unemployment. We could increase poverty if we act in a way that's foolish in terms of regulating uh, carbon emissions and regulating climate. 
But there are ideas out there that can do this at very, very low cost. Um, and one of them comes really from something that Republican and conservative economists frequently say, which is tax the bad, not the good. Whatever it is that you tax, you tend to get less of it. It will go down. If you tax income, you will see a slight drop in income beyond a certain level. If you tax uh, whatever, people will shift their activity to something else that has less tax on it. So we can improve the tax algorithm itself. This is a variant of what's called a revenue neutral carbon tax. So imagine today the government makes this much money off of income tax, if you will, or some combination of taxes. Let's just call it income tax. And we have no carbon tax. Now, we want to tax carbon because we don't want people to emit it. But we don't want to have a huge negative impact on the economy overall. So the idea, very simply, is you shift the balance. You put a price on the pollutant while lowering the prices on things that people do right now that are not considered harmful. You have the same net economic impact but when people go to shop to buy energy or buy goods, that carbon price is levied on the dirty ones and not on the clean ones, and the consumer behavior shifts. So ultimately, pollution is not an inevitable outcome of growth. We've gone from rivers on fire to rivers you can drink out of, from an ozone layer that was dying to one that's recovering. The issue is not limits, it's the policies we have and the design of our economy. So what can we do, all of us here? There's four things that I think about. One is communicate, because belief in these issues as problems at all spreads by word of mouth and from person to person. And especially for those who are um, centrists or more on the right, Al Gore is never going to convince people in those categories that there is a problem with climate, for instance. It really happens with conversation <coughs> between people they trust. Pardon me. People they trust. Two is participate. A lot of the action these days in climate policy in particular is happening at a state level. About half of all states have renewable energy portfolio standards, so they must reach a certain level of solar and wind penetration. And state congressmen and state senators get very, very few calls to their offices. And a little bit of action there can actually shift things tremendously. And now a few cities, Seattle and Portland among them, have pledges to become the first carbon neutral cities in the world, and it's worth a call to the city council, your city councilman, or the mayor's office to say you support that idea. Three is innovate. I often give this talk to people who are uh, considering career shifts or just coming out of school, and there's a lot to be considered for what uh, people themselves can do by going into this field. And in fact, we're mostly geeks here. In the energy space, a lot of the action right now is in software information management to improve efficiency of delivery of energy, to find new ways to make it work out for people. And finally, it's to keep hope, because we have solved problems like this in the past. Every time it took a little bit longer than it should have, every time we delayed longer than we should have, but in each and every one, when it's become serious, we've actually tackled it, and we've come out on the other side better. So ultimately, ideas are the most powerful source of uh, wealth that we have. And thank you very much. <clears throat>I'll take a few questions now, um, and there's books in the back if you want to buy one, and I'll sign those books as well. <coughs> yes, sir. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the problem, actually. It, it almost feels like the goal is to try to fit as many sardines into the can as possible, <laughs> and, and that this technology will enable that. I mean, I understand what you said about uh, increasing education and so forth has a direct relationship to the number of children so but doesn't this uh, I sidestep a, a bigger problem I mean wouldn't things just keep the population keep growing and so forth if if we keep solving these problems I'm not saying that we shouldn't solve the problems I'm just worried about it it, it doesn't address the, the, the bigger issue yes yeah, so there's a there's a the question is hey if we solve these problems won't we just uh, keep over exploiting resources keep growing population and let's create new ones um, I don't think so, and I, I don't think so for two reasons. One is that uh, when people get rich, their population growth ends. Right? It's not scarcity. It's really women deciding there's something else they'd rather do with their lives than have more kids. Right? And deciding to have kids later in life than they did before. And two is that with all those physical resources, it looks like society's peak. That in water use per person, in metal use per person, um, Europe and the US and Japan and Australia have all peaked a few decades ago and are holding steady or dropping. 
So it, it does look like, it's winning the data now, that when people reach a certain level of wealth, mostly they, they consume more services and more information goods, movies, Facebook, whatever, uh, but the use of physical resources doesn't go up anymore at all, is what it looks like. I recently finished reading Jared Diamond's Collapse, which okay. I'm sure you've read many times. It, how do you see the impact of China and India on all this? Because we're pretty enlightened about these sorts of things in, in the first world. But uh, I read about the environmental issues and the lack of awareness in China and the lack of government policy to try to keep this uh, resource management issue under control. What will that take to, to get that in alignment? Yeah. China is sort of a paradox. Um, China is an environmental mess, and yet China is actually acting more forcefully on climate change than the US is. So this summer, uh, June 17th, actually, just in a couple weeks now, uh, China's first carbon limits will go into place on Shanghai, Guangzhou, and a couple other locations, seven cities by the end of the year, including Beijing as well. By 2016, they've announced they'll have a national uh, carbon cap and a national carbon tax plan. And China is also the number one producer of and consumer of renewable energy. So it's, it's a funny situation. And I think some of it amounts to this. China has a rapidly, not a rapidly growing population, but a rapidly growing middle class. It has people who are consuming more, and not almost always in a society, what you see is that a poor society has very little pollution. A society getting richer goes up in pollution dramatically. It's called the environmental Kuznets curve. And then a society gets to the point that we did with the Cuyahoga River and says, whoa, okay, we're rich enough now that we actually care about the environment, and now we're going to put rules in place to, to start to taper that damage down. It's happened in the US, Canada, Europe, et cetera. And in China now, you see the birth of environmental movement. You see protests happening that have stopped the creation of power plants, of chemical factories, and so on, as people are starting to get to the point where they're wealthy enough that they care more about the environment than they do about deregulation or, or more growth of this. So I think we'll see China in the long term making that, that shift about their own local pollution issues. They're kind of nearing the peak of where the US was in the bad times. But already, they're acting more aggressively on climate than we are. And that, that last part I attribute in large part to who their leadership is. I wouldn't wish the Chinese government on anyone. I wouldn't want it here. But when you look at the makeup of the Politburo, uh, the current president was trained as a chemical engineer. His predecessor was a hydraulic engineer. His predecessor was an elect electrical engineer. Uh, if you look at the rest of the Politburo Standing Committee, which is the top leadership, I think seven of the nine of them were trained as engineers or physical scientists. So there's no debate there about whether or not climate change is happening, unlike our government. The debate is just how do we address climate change while pushing as much of the cost of it as possible onto the rich world that created the problem and making as much room as possible for our people to rise out of poverty. That's really the way that it, that it happens in China, I think. Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about um, you know, addressing uh, you know, the resources like water and food and things that like, you know, you can see as renewable. Um, how do you feel about, you know, talking about like lithium ion batteries or things that have like very finite quantities on the earth and how increased growth relates with that? Um, it's a good question. I'll repeat it. That what about kind of minerals or raw materials that are like lithium ion where there's only so much I think there's two things. One is we're better and better at extracting it, at finding it. So people have worried for a long time that we're about to run out of some raw material. Phosphorus is one people worry about now. But when you look at those windows, whenever they get short, they get long again because people invest in some new technology to find it. And two is we're getting very, very good at recycling. So now we see that people are investing more and more at landfill mining. So even the difference between recycling and trash is getting smaller and smaller in a lot of areas where Japan estimates that their landfills alone contain a 10 to 15 year supply of gold and rare earth minerals for the entire world. Um, and so they're starting to invest. As prices rose since 2008, they decided let's invest in actually getting that, that value back out. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is for a lot of those things, for the rare metals and rare minerals, people are aggressively looking at what alternatives are there. So it used to be that solar panels used a lot of rare earth minerals, but if you chart you know, how many grams of rare earth per watt, that also has plunged and plunged and plunged as manufacturers have said, hey, this is going to be scarce. Let's find a way to use less and less of it. Yes, sir. Your uh, 
when you talk about carbon trading, essentially right here, carbon taxation, in your case, that worked very well in the case of silver dioxide, um, specifically because in order to have that sort of market, you have to assign property rights. And it worked well because the property rights were by and large given to the existing holders, the power plants, the coal miners, etc. cetera. Um, that system hasn't worked at all in Europe, in part because the rights weren't given to the existing holders, and in part because the the level of the alignment, uh, the, the level of the uh, the rights assignment was too high. So here, what it looked like you were proposing is that all the rights are assigned to the government, um, and, and and ending up with what looks to be a very regressive tax. How do you reconcile that? So there's the question is about how carbon trading works. Yeah. Well, I'm just repeating it for the for the the people in the. People are watching us electronically. We're being watched. Um, so I'll say a couple things. One is there's two variants you can you approaches you can take. One is sort of the cap and trade approach. One is the the pure tax approach. Um, I favor the pure tax approach, and I think most economists do too, because it's just straight out simpler. What we see in Europe is they have a, a cap and trade approach, and so now the price has gone very low because the recession means that. People aren't trying to emit that much CO2 anyway, and it's subject to those problems. If you plan wrong, you end up with a very low price. Um, I, it doesn't have to be regressive, though, because you can structure it in such a way that the reduction in other taxes, or even a direct check back to people, is structured such that people at the bottom uh, get back as much or more than they're paying in additional prices. Uh, there's various ways to do that. The simplest one is everybody just gets a check that is their share uh, in an even way across the population of uh, the amount paid by polluters. All of that said, I'd say that the idea that Europe's carbon market is failing isn't quite right. So what we see in Europe is Europe created a slope for carbon emissions allowances. The slope went like this, but Europe has actually gone much faster. So the only reason the price is low is because Europe's total carbon emissions are lower than what the government thought they needed to hit. So I it's not how I would have designed the system. I don't think it's perfect, but it is actually working in the sense of they're below the target that they established. A couple more questions? Yes? How optimistic are you that we can avoid the climate bomb? Um, how optimistic am I that we can avoid the climate bomb? I think, in general, things will get worse before they get better. So I think. We will come out of this OK, but with some serious scars that we've seen. Uh, the most recent data says that it's unlikely that we'll see an explosive release of billions of tons of methane all at once. Uh, but these things are hard to model. We do see that the tundra is, is thawing, and it's not a good thing. Um, I think what will happen is two lines will cross, and that's when we'll start to take real action. Those lines are, number one, the rising fraction of people who are really convinced that there is a problem. And that happens not with graphs, but with pictures, or with uh, heat waves, with sea ice melting, with storms hitting New York, Sandy. The, all of that lifts belief. And the second is the declining cost of the solution. When you travel through Texas now, Texas is the number one wind power state. People now are like, oh, wind power? I thought that was just for hippies a few years ago. But now, OK, I guess, I, I guess it seems OK. So that sort of drives acceptance. And I think that there's a self-correcting element, which is that as things get worse and worse, the more problems that we see, the more that will drive upticks in belief. So if things start to go south very, very rapidly, I think you will see a more rapid uh, belief spike as well. The question is, is there a chance that it goes too fast, faster than we can react? Right now, it looks like that probably won't happen, but it is a very real risk. Do you think we'll be in the realm of geoengineering? To I, these problems. I personally favor, I think we, we're foolish to not at least do more geoengineering research. Uh, we've invested very, very little in it so far, and there are situations where it could do a lot of good. I think geoengineering, specifically around the Arctic, if we can do targeted uh, reflection of sunlight to help cool that region and help trap that buried carbon, I think that would be a very smart thing to do. Yes. Liz, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm reading The World Without Us. And the author talks pretty interestingly about the DMZ in Korea and how it's a fascinating accidental experiment because no humans are there by design. And what they've seen is sort of a regeneration of the planet. 
that because there's no humans there, eco has grown, birds that were dying have come back, and just all these fascinating sort of things that when you get humans out of the way are coming back. And I wonder if that's a model that could be applied across the planet to solve some of these things, to say, could you depopulate certain areas of the planet by design for periods of time to sort of get these things under control? So the question is, could we depopulate certain parts of the planet to let nature uh, recover? Well, I, there is something in, that I talk about in the book that I think is very interesting along those lines, which is most of the world's population does not live on most of the world's land. What happens is that the world's land area is overwhelmingly used. It's either it's not usable, it's deserts and mountains and swamps, or it's agricultural land. And then now, more than half of humanity lives in cities. These are about 1% of the world's land. So you can imagine a scenario where we can need to grow yields on farms fast enough that we can use less and less and less farmland to feed the population, who will increasingly live in cities. And we can take some of that farmland that is very sparsely populated anyway and turn that back over to nature. Um, and that's something that I think is, is very interesting. It's certainly theoretically possible on paper. Whether or not uh, kind of the market forces align to drive that much yield increase um, and what we decide to do with that land. Is it privatized or is it turned back into national parks or national forests? We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, well I think we'll stop there. I'll be back there and uh, I'll be happy to sign books. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.